as an exorcist, I have seen demonic entities with my eyes. I've seen them. So how many exorcisms have you performed? Well, I mean, that would be more than I can count, probably, in the, I mean, definitely in the hundreds. Um, but it's important, I think, to note that most exorcisms are not what you, you know, associate with, like, the movies. You know, those are called solemn exorcisms where, you know, the person's usually pretty bad off. It's usually full-blown possession, and it requires all of the resources of the rights of exorcism to resolve those kinds of cases. But those are so rare we almost never see them. However, um, minor exorcisms are what we tend to perform more often than not. And that resolves, I'd say, 98, 99% of all cases that we see. So when you do an exorcism, right? Like, let's look at the minor exorcism and then the major exorcism, so to speak. What are you doing in a minor exorcism? What are you doing in a major one? Well, in a minor one, um, it's, it's, it's shorter by hours uh, I'd, I'd say a, a solemn exorcism could take um on any given session could take three four hours to complete uh whereas a minor exorcism can typically be done in less than a half an hour um it's a shorter prayer um it is really just that it's a prayer a very aggressive prayer where the um the person who confers it, which is usually going to be a priest, although um, there are minor exorcisms that are authorized for the laity to use as well, um, where the individual affirms their their Christian authority over dark forces. And that's essentially all it is. Uh, with a solemn exorcism or a major exorcism, what you're now doing is having to go through the process of unraveling the onion that is the the case. Typically, this is reserved for possessions only. Minor exorcisms can be perf performed on any particular kind of uh, disturbance. It can be performed on an object, a location, or a person. Um, they typically are used for uh, resolving demonic uh, oppressions or obsessions, but possession is usually reserved for the solemn rite. Can you give me an example of like what that prayer would be, the minor exorcism prayer? Uh, yeah, it's it's uh, you, you call on um, the Blessed Virgin, you call on St. Michael the Archangel, you call on all of the forces of the church to um, liberate the object, location, or person from the effects of what has been confirmed to be some kind of malevolent um, spiritual force like a demon. Um, and, um, and that's essentially it. One of the simplest ones. Uh, that the laity can use. Uh, it doesn't have to be an exorcist that prays. This is, is the St. Michael prayer. St. Michael the archangel, defend us in battle. Be our safeguard against the wickedness and sneers of the devil. May thou uh, rebuke thee. Um, you know, that kind of stuff. And then you just continue on. You know, it's, it's not a long prayer, but, you know, th these are just things that you can use to facilitate that connection um, to assist and aid in the client's uh, recovery process. Because essentially as an exorcist, you are, you know, you are a, a, a facilitator, you know, you're not a magician, you're not a wizard, you're not coming in performing incantations. Um, what you're doing is you're facilitating um, the victim's connection to God. So what is the person possessed by? That's, that's an interesting question. I mean, that will vary depending upon who you talk to. The conventional understanding in the church is that this is a, uh, a sentient um, fallen angel, you know, that um, a, a, one of these forces of the devil that are out there looking for targets. And so, you know, that's where, as an exorcist, I have seen demonic entities with my eyes. I've seen them. How many, like what percentage of the people that you would say come to you, come to you with an issue that is not worthy of an exorcism? <laughs> um, I would say when we started this work, it would have been probably somewhere. I mean, this is not a scientific number. It's just yeah, sort yeah, of a yeah. idea of my own experience. I'd say probably about 60 to 70% when I started this work. But now that I've been on TV, now it's like probably closer to 90, 95% because we have a lot of malingerers now. It brings in a certain amount of that.
Yeah, it does. It does. So from a religious perspective, and I know that I'm going to get this wrong. It kind of confuses me. I, I can never quite keep it straight, right? But from a <laughs> yeah. religious perspective, is this a a Christian thing? Is this a Catholic thing? The flavor of it that we deal with is specifically Christian. But the idea of working with evil forces that need to be resolved through some kind of exorcism process sort of exists in some capacity in every religion, every major religion. Um, And even the minor ones too. I mean, shamanism has formulas for dealing with evil spirits. Um, You know, Judaism has uh, ways of negotiating with dibbics and evil spirits to rid a family of some kind of attachment that could potentially come up. Uh, Islam has methods for working with the jinn. They, they, they understand them to be different things than what Christianity does. Christianity will, of course, see them more as like fallen angels or, you know, uh, rebellious evil spirits. Whereas Buddhism would say, well, no, these are, the, these are the forces of attachment that are here to pull you back into the wheel of samsara so that you can never liberate yourself and you're stuck, you know, reincarnating and indefinitely until you finally resolve your karma. Um, and so, but they, they do all of these religions, see them as external forces that need to be contended with in an external way. How does the church necessarily look at it, right? Does the church look at this as like, look, exorcism is a fundamental thing along with kind of, you know, the basic tenets of the religion or even within the church are people kind of like, I don't know about that. Uh, it's changing. Um, there are, of course, people in the church that take it seriously, you know, um, but there are people in the church that think it's a lot of nonsense. And, you know, these are people that need mental health care. And there are even priests. Um, I've known them. Um, I've, I've been trained by them, um, you know, that, that will look at exorcism and say, well, that's just... That's just how we would have understood mental illness in the in the ancient world or in the Middle Ages. We didn't have psychology. I'll be dramatic and kind of asking the inevitable question, right? But what would you what would you say to somebody who might be listening to this and just what are you talking about, right? Like, <laughs> what is this? None of this is real. You can't prove any of this. It's not about proving it. See, incorporeal experience. It has to be dealt with at the level of where that individual's at. And so it doesn't matter if it's objectively true to you or not. What matters is a person's having an experience and um, it is destroying their life and the church and its methods work. So why would we not use it just because you don't believe in it? Um, you're not that important. None of us are, you know, so a person that rejects it, okay, reject it. You know, that's, that's your prerogative. But for the people that actually go through this, they're grateful that there is uh, an individual that cares enough uh, to be able to help them through it. And hopefully the church is doing its job in that because that's what it exists to do is to help people through those incorporeal challenges. I mean, um, so to me, it's irrelevant whether or not people believe it or not. I, that's not, I don't do this to prove it to myself or to prove it to anyone. I do this because it works and it's worked for thousands of years. Um, all these religions around the world, uh, know it works, whether they're Christian or not. Um, and I think it's kind of arrogant for us in our modern day to say, oh, well, we understand it now. And that's all a bunch of nonsense when, uh, you know, Billions, if not trillions of people over the last 4,000, 5,000 years had an understanding about this and used it. And it became part of our reality to the point that all over the world it was, it's being utilized. And only today have we started to say, oh, that's nonsense. I mean, that's arrogant. You're going you're gonna to just throw out what all of our ancestors have believed for 5,000 years just because you think you're more enlightened than they are. Maybe you're missing something. So that's kind of how I would answer a person that says that to me because it's like, you know, you're kind of missing the point. We're not about proving anything. Yeah, ghost hunters are about proving and let them go and prove if they can. I'm not a ghost hunter. You know, I am here to help people with um, an incorporeal problem. And there's no science that that can objectively work with that. Even psychology fails. And you, you'd be surprised how many psychologists call us 
with clients that they will say they've seen things that they can only say relates to what they've seen in the movies on possession. And they're like, I don't know if I'm equipped to deal with this. I've even once said this is above my pay grade, um, you know, and they call us. Uh, so even psychologists, even medical doctors, I've even had medical doctors call me, not just for their patients, but for themselves. Um, so, you know, it's all well and good and you can dismiss it and not believe in it until it happens to you. And then, you know, you'll be grateful. There are people like me that can, that know how to resolve it. I don't really even know what I necessarily believe. Like I change my mind about what I believe all the time, but I would say that I do believe that it doesn't matter if it's real. If you think it's real, your mind's a powerful thing. Like the reality of it is irrelevant if somebody really believes this, I guess. The it's true. I mean, it is true. The only thing that I guess would be to use devil's advocate. I don't know if that's the right word, right? But like, <laughs> what if you get somebody that is convinced that, okay, it's it's a demon, I'm possessed, and you go about this route, but maybe this person is schizophrenic. I don't know about mental health enough to, but I think you know what I'm asking, right? Like, what if you go down this road and it was like, oh, really, they need this and they need this medication, right? Has Does that happen? Is that a concern that you guys have? Well, that's why the psychological evaluations are so important. So if a person is diagnosed with a psychotic disorder like schizophrenia or bipolar disorder or acute psychosis, anything like that, um, then we're just there as 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 spiritual support and in, in the capacity of any pastor, we go and we pray with them if they want that, if that's what they want. But they're not going to get an exorcism. The only time we would come in is if there starts to be manifestations that cannot be explained by schizophrenia. And so if there's, um, if the person's living in the house, you know, with a family and the family's experiencing paranormal events, well, schizophrenia shouldn't do that. Why did you, how did you get into this? Like, why did you pursue this? Uh, exorcism? You know, I, I really didn't. Um, I found my vocation again. I, I, discovered my vocation to priest at very, I was probably around 16 years old and uh, just wanted to keep running away from it because I didn't like the idea of celibacy. You know, as a Roman Catholic priest, I knew I could never be married and that wasn't attractive to me. I wanted to have a family. Um, and there was other thing, factors, you know, just not, I wanted to be an investment banker. So it was like, that's a big difference from, you know, being a clergyman. And, uh, you know, the, uh, those were my interests, you know, and this was not interesting to me, but it just kept resurfacing and coming back. And eventually I tried to bridge the gap with psychology, you know, trying to find sort of a, uh, a more interesting way of pursuing, helping people. But, you know, but it, it, the, you know, the long story short, I ended up here. And, but my goal was really just to be a pastor, you know, perform weddings, baptize babies, hear confessions, you know, just do pastoral things. You know, no one chooses, I don't think, to say, oh, I want to be an exorcist. So we were getting people coming to us um, that were asking for this kind of help, um, but they were being rejected by the Roman Catholic Church locally. And so they said, well, they won't help us. Can you help us? And I said, well, I mean, my duty as a pastor is to help everyone that steps through my door if I can. So tell me what's going on. And so um, they explained it. And um, I had had some training in this when I was a seminarian in the Roman Catholic Church working under a mentor, Pastor Emeritus, who's now deceased. Um, and and I said, well, I, I, I know what to do. I can I can try to help where, you know, the Roman Catholic diocese wouldn't. And we resolved it, you know, and it, I guess word got out and they started telling people and then other people started coming to us. And before we knew it, people were coming to us more for this than anything else. And as a pastor, my obligation is to just help people spiritually wherever they're at and that's what they needed. So that's kind of how I fell into this work. And, um, and that's how it got started. So yeah, I, I mean, it kind of fell into it out of necessity, not because I chose to, to, to do it. Um, are you ready for some harder slash listener submitted questions? Let's do it. Are there different stages of demonic possession? Oh yes, definitely. Um, 
the general stages that we look at, and of, of course they don't necessarily follow this in some kind of linear order, um, and it's not like it will always be the same pattern every time. It can there can sometimes be full blown possession right off the, as the first manifestation, although that's exceptionally rare. But typically the stages that we look for or assess would be the first and most simple would be just basically what I call demonic interference, and that's what we all experience this whether we believe in demons or evil or not and that is that's the yetzahara experience that's like you know going through and doing something but all of a sudden like there's this kind of negative voice in the back of your subconscious saying why don't you do this this would be better even though you know it's wrong so you know anytime you get a temptation to do the wrong thing which we all have experienced at some point in our life and you're lying to yourself if you think you haven't um that would be demonic interference. That would be sort of the first stage, honestly, because in a lot of cases that if that's allowed to progress, if a person's allowed to indulge us too much in those temptations, it can, it can, it can include a, a, a sort of um, upward spiral, or I should say a downward spiral into deeper forms of, of demonic activity. So the second is the more, is more severe and that's going to be like demonic, um, obsession and demonic obsession is when it affects mostly their their psyche and their emotional centers but doesn't really have any physical manifestation at all they're they're usually in good health there's nothing else going on but they're every everything that they're experiencing seems to be psychological this is a very difficult stage because this is almost indistinguishable from mental illness the third uh, would be um, demonic uh, oppression, and that's where it can look a lot like possession, but it's not. The person still has uh, control over their own faculties, but now it starts to affect their external world. It starts to affect their family. It starts to affect their health. Um, and then the last stage is possession. So that's going to be when they no longer have control over their faculties, where they truly lose themselves in this in this evil persona that sort of takes over and speaks for them and controls them and completely destroys their life and their relationships there's a subcategory that's kind of related but is its own thing and that would be a demonic infestation that tends to affect people through either oppression or obsession or could even lead to possession but it's when an environment is it has the attachment instead of a person. And these are really interesting because what this shows us is that the energy is tangible to the point that it's not just all in someone's head. If one wants to see, you know, see it that way, it does have some kind of externalization. There are places that this energy exists and it makes people extremely sick when they coexist in those environments for too long. Um, so that's kind of all the stages. That's what we're looking for when we're trying to determine whether or not there's a genuine demonic event going on. It's going to fall into one of those five uh, categories. The, um, the infestation, like, can you give me an example of that? Like a place that you've seen or th th this would just be uh, where a place just feels evil. You know, I mean, to the lay person going in, they might say, I get a bad feeling in that place. I don't like it there. I don't want to go back there. And they don't know why. They might, they, they, might, they might believe in demons. They might not. But they'll just, usually anybody, even an atheist, could go in and say, there's just something that's unpleasant about this. And they might try to find tangible reasons for why they might feel that way. But when you're there, it feels dark. It feels disturbing it it, it it can give people anxiety it can raise their blood pressure when they're in these places um and um there's just something um, disturbed about it and i think there's you know places where there has been a lot of trauma in pop culture context it might just get labeled as a haunting or you know something of that nature you might say Amityville would be a good example if you want to, I mean, not that I believe Amityville was a real thing. I don't, I really don't. I think that was a made up story. But if it were a real story, if it did happen the way it was reported, then that would be an example of a demonic infestation. A trauma happened there, murders, you know, family murders, you know, kids were killed and 
there was residual energy that sort of took on a life it's of, of its own and so that new people would move in and be affected. The reason I don't believe it is that only the Lutz has ever said there was anything going on. There was a lot of holes to their story and everybody that's lived in the house after that has reported nothing. Worst case you've ever had. Well, any full-blown possession. So I, I think I, I can't really say there's one worse than another. They're all... Um, they're all difficult. They're all unpleasant to witness. Um, they're hard to resolve. Once it gets to that point, um, it can take months or even years. I guess the part of my work that is a little magical, you know, uh, and sort of works outside of the the will of the person is that I can bring them back to to awareness. You know, so when if a person's far too far gone into a possession where only the demon is talking then the rites of exorcism can bring them back to a certain stage of coherence where you can then reason with them. And that's when you really have to do your work. Okay, all these prayers and holy water is all great and all, but the real work is getting them sober again, bringing them back to a state of, of, of sobriety, awareness, and then being able to be like, okay, now I need you to work with me. I need you to help me. Let's, let's purge this from your life. So when we talk about like a full possession, what does that look like? What does that really look like? Okay, so it's a lot like the movies, you know. Um, so if we're going to use like The Exorcist, like Linda Blair as sort of the archetype of possession, it's a lot like that, only that's more exaggerated than what we would really see. So you're never going to see head spinning. I've never encountered that. You're not going to see levitation to the ceiling. Um, but you will see some of that profane behavior, the vulgarity, the, the nasty, um, you know, uh, verbal attacks against the priests or sacrilege, you know, that, that they will sometimes say. Um, there will be that guttural sort of beastly voice that can sometimes come out of people that you're, you could not fathom that they could make those noises or sound like that. Um, I've seen um, children young girls, um, maybe younger than Linda Blair in that movie, um, talk with a deep masculine voice that it's like, there's just no way their vocal cords could produce that sound. Um, you'll sometimes see words, not quite like where it comes out in this three dimensional help me, but there'll be like scratches on the, on the body that will form letters that can turn into words or symbols, um, speaking in languages that they have never learned is something that we will sometimes see, not always, but sometimes. Sometimes you'll hear more than one voice coming out of them. And that's always an interesting manifestation because how could you be saying two different things from the same voice? Um, uh, and that's when there's more than one presence, which is often you know, one of the things that you want to know is not only getting their name, but you want to know how many are there and how many do you have to expel? It's not really expelling. It's more like dissolving, but that's another story. Um, as far as, as you know, everything else, it's, it's what you kind of would expect. They're violent. They're angry. Um, they're disturbed. They can go stiff as a board. Um, they can increase in strength far beyond what a person of their stature could could normally produce. Um, I've seen uh, little old ladies be able to really wrestle you out with wrestle five guys. I've seen children knock two guys over, you know, with just moving their arm. I mean, it, it can be very exaggerated in that respect, but... Um, you know, you know it when you see it. Uh, it it's, it's, wouldn't be shocking in the sense, I mean, it'd be shocking because you'd be like, I didn't know this could actually really happen. But um, it wouldn't shock you like, I, this is so different than I thought it would be. You know, you'd be like, yeah, this is kind of what I expected. Um, it's just kind of shocking that you're seeing it with your own eyes and not on a television screen with an actor. Right, like, man, I would be like, oh my God, I would get out of there. <laughs> like, well, I'm done. I'm out of yeah. here. Do you get yeah. scared? No, no. Um, I've never, never been um, 
frightened by anything that I've done in this work. Um, it, it just doesn't bother me, although I, I know there are people that do get bothered by it. Um, we've had people that once they've had that one big case, they've never come back. Um, we've had people that could not control the effects of doing this work for the long term and have slowly develop their own attachments or more accurately, I should say some of the darkness that is already latent within them has started to surface through having been exposed to this kind of energy on a regular basis and not taking the proper spiritual precautions to avoid that from happening. Um, and then they have to leave, you know, so we're a very small team now. I used to have like, uh, gosh, I used to have like 10 or 10 over 10 people and now we, I pretty much work with uh, three or four. Um, and if it's a if it's a case with a actual possession, then we, we might bring in a couple extra guys to hold the victim down if they get violent, um, because that can just one of the things that the that the demonic entity will always try to do is um, is distract. They will always try to stop and interrupt the process. So you need to reduce the, 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 the potential for that by having other people that are there to kind of just hold them down so that I can just do my work. Um, but you know, there's been cases where I've had to wrestle the client myself, you know, because we just don't have the, the, the manpower. I try to avoid those situations, but I'm perfectly capable of doing it if I have to. Um, and we've, we've, we've done that a few times. This one kind of end, I guess, on a slightly lighter note. I guess. <laughs> okay. Um, movie with the best description of it. Movie with kind of the worst description of it. Well, the worst one I've seen in recent time was The Pope's Exorcist. That was just horrible. Um, not only was it inaccurate, but it was just a terrible movie. Um, very disappointed in that. And I expected more from Russell Crowe. Um, the best one, I don't know if it's the best depiction um but it's it, it was fairly accurate in many ways and that was the right with anthony hopkins um i would say that's a really good i, I mean as good as hollywood's gonna get it uh in terms of that respect um also the exorcist isn't bad it's just again it's exaggerated um but a lot of the things you see in there not the the crab walk that was like deleted and then put in the special edition, I, you know, that kind of stuff doesn't typically happen. Um, not the levitation to the ceiling and all of the things I already mentioned, but as far as like the way that the person looks sick and that their physical face faces, you know, the physical face changes and they're not the person they used to be. That's all very accurate. The priest resolution in that movie was absolutely completely wrong. Um, you never would say, take me, damn it, take me, um, you know, and then jump out the window to kill it. That, that's not how, <laughs> that is not an effective exorcism. <laughs> and that would be honestly laughable to be like, if you, you had no business being an exorcist to begin with, if that's your solution. Um, no, you would stay there and fight it out until that person's liberated. And, and if you're not strong enough to do that, then you have no business doing the work to begin with so um that was the only part of course that was for dramatic effect right, right they had to make yeah. something crazy go on so i you can forgive it on the basis that it's a good story um but everything else was actually quite uh well done i haven't seen the new one the new exorcist film that's in theaters now i want to see it um i've seen them all in fact we were we're, we're talking about, I've had the, the full collection. This used to be the definitive collection, but now they have the new movie, so I have yeah, to get another one. But, um, they're pretty good. I mean, again, they're, they're fanciful. Um, they're exaggerations of the truth, but um, there is like bits and pieces of accuracy in there. And, and yeah, I, I like them. They're, they're, they're enjoyable movies to watch. That's pretty much all the questions we got. If I mean, what's kind of coming up next for you? How can people get a hold of you if they need help? That kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, well, we have uh, a website, esotericcatholic.org. Um, you can also just go directly to nicolaean.org, N-I-C-H-O-L-E-A-N.org. Um, they're both the same site, just different URLs to get you there. Uh, and there's a contact form there. There's a request and investigation form. There's a lot of information about the things that we do. Um, one thing I would always encourage people to do is, is, is to um, watch our podcast, um, Vestiges After Dark. It's uh, every Tuesday, win in season, 
at 8 p.m. Eastern. Um, you can just get there directly by going to YouTube at Nicolaean, again, N-I-C-H-O-L-E-A-N, or just clicking on the links on the website on esotericcatholic.org. We're also, it's a podcast. So that if you want to see the video version, you can watch it on YouTube live. If you want to listen to the podcast version, you can listen live on Spreaker, or you can just wait until the show um, is finished. And then usually about a half hour later, it shows up on all the platforms. Have you ever seen or experienced something that you could not explain? No. Hmm. That was a little bit of hesitation there. I mean, I, I had one experience when I was a teenager that I, I have no idea how it happens. Um, but it happened. But I mean, it's it's not even a good story. Me and my friend were watching horror movies at like 3 a.m. I had a latch on my door as a kid and the latch unlocked itself. Oh, but did the door like move or anything like that? Yeah, the door kind of swung open a little bit, but, you know, I mean, it's, I, I don't know, my window was open. It was kind of a windy night. Would it have uh, been that windy to unlatch a door? Probably not, but there has to be a reason because, you know, it's, it, you're going to, I'm going to go on a whole rant here. Just, just go All I'm going to say is Bigfoot isn't real and probably neither are ghosts. I'm sorry to ruin everyone's uh, Halloween. Yeah, my thing with ghosts is, if there was actually ghosts, I looked this up, right? I looked this up, because I was bored one day and I just was thinking about this. But I looked this up. There's been 128 billion people that they think have existed on Earth at one time. If there was actually ghosts, there would be so many ghosts. Like, it wouldn't even be a question if there were ghosts. There'd be so many of them. They'd be everywhere. Yes. First off, I agree 100% with that. If there was a Sasquatch, if there was a Bigfoot, they would have been seen by now. There would have been a one documented case of these things actually being seen or found. Uh, same with ghosts. If there were really ghosts, there were really demons that can inhabit your brain, it would have been proven by now. My only thing with that kind of stuff is you have to be either or. Like, if you believe in this one thing, you've got to believe in all of it. You've got to believe in all the possibilities, right? Like, if you believe in ghosts, then you got to believe in... Then you can't be there and be like, well, but demons, that's a total BS. Like, if you believe in one, you've got to acknowledge the possibility of all of them. I mean, they usually kind of go hand in hand, I think, with... You know, if you believe in demons, you believe in ghosts. If you believe in the Megalodon, you believe in the Loch Ness Monster. But do you have one out there conspiracy theory? Do you have one thing that like this is the only thing of that realm or ilk or whatever that like oh I kind of I kind of think this might be true maybe Bigfoot because maybe it's just some deformed bear species that you know no one's ever been able to catch maybe there's like six of them and they just keep having Bigfoot babies I don't know or Sasquatch like but once again I I, I believe like you know like the dinosaurs right. There's at least existence, like there's, you know, bones that they existed. I mean, there's nothing for any of these, any of these. It's all folklore. It's folklore. It's all Greek mythology, but modern day. The only one that I kind of like, oh, maybe would be the idea that we're living in a simulation. Because when I think about when I hear about like space and things like that, I'm like, no, no, the sun's not like 90. Like That's too big of a thing for me to even comprehend in my mind. That would be the only reason I'd be like, if that turned out to be true, I don't think that I would be super shocked. I'd be like, you know what? If I found that out after I died, I would be like, you know, I always kind of wondered. Like, what if I'm an actor? What if you're an actor? What if our wives aren't even in love with us? What if they just play a role and then like... You know, in 10 years, they're just going to leave us and go be with their real families. That would be kind of crazy, actually, if you think about it. That, like, one day people are just like, you know what, man? This is all fake. Like, this was just a movie we were filming. We're out of here now. I mean, maybe our children aren't even ours. And, like, you know, I, I don't know. Who knows? I just feel like if that was true, my life would be more dramatic. Like, there's not... I don't think that a reality TV show based around my life would be that interesting. Yeah, unless like you're set up to fail and you just keep continually uh, choosing the right path. Right, like it's a real slow burn that like one day <laughs> he's going to get it wrong 
and it turns out this is the guy that like dooms the human race and we're just watching to see how it happens yeah like maybe you are maybe you have like eye of the beholder and for all you know like you are the key to unlocking the galaxy and everyone's like is this week the week that he's finally gonna eat peanut butter instead of rubbing it on his balls i mean i don't I don't, I don't know how to even respond to that because I was kind of like not listening. And then the only last thing I got was peanut butter on his balls. And I was just like, I don't, I don't know what to say. You need to become a better listener. You know that you are, you need to become a more, you need to become a more astute. uh, I'll be there in a minute. No. What? What were we saying? I'm saying that's exactly. (laughs) See, that's a, exactly what I'm sa- talking about. Do, could you ever foresee a situation in which somehow in the annals of history, like the human race is doomed and it all comes back to like it was turns out it was John Shaw who did it. Like no. they trace it back and they're like, do you never feel like you could make one decision that could doom the human race? No, and I'm not even entirely sure that one person holds that power. And I'm not saying this to bring up terrible memories because we know what's currently going on in the world. But there have been some really terrible human beings that have tried to plot things out to, you know, get rid of certain races of people. And even that has never worked. So I don't think that I'm going to be the one person that dooms humanity. Right. But it's always the bullet you don't see coming. Right. It could be just you making a decision one day and you set off a chain reaction because you didn't check your blinker or your rear view mirror and you cause this thing that causes the end of all of Detroit. I mean, it would be kind of wild. Like if I, you know, I'm driving and I accidentally sideswipe a, a, a van carrying a nuclear bomb that goes off and then someone overseas thinks we're firing one and then they fire one and that would be pretty right wild. like it could be the destruction of america could be <laughs> potentially traced back to like one random person who made a mistake yeah i don't i don't really want to think about that because i want to be driving really cautiously the next few days you could make a decision at any moment that could set off a domino effect that could doom the entire civilization well, I don't. First of all, I don't think it's that dramatic. Oh, yeah, I think I, it is. I think it could happen. No, I think you can have a series of of events that can like ruin your world and other people's worlds. But I don't. I don't think there's anything that I could be involved in that I could doom the human race with. So we had somebody that was on here a little while ago. We had a space weather researcher, and they talked about the idea that there has to be people all over the place that closely monitor what is happening with the sun and solar storms. Well, what if that person goes to the bathroom and, like, somebody else called out (laughs) sick, and then in that 15 minutes there's a solar storm that wipes out all technology on the face of the earth? Because they they weren't there to, like, shut down the equipment. There's always a backup to the backup, right? You can always mess up in pretty much any profession, and it's not the end of the world. I'm as guilty as this as anybody, so when I say this... Consider the fact that I include myself in this. There's one thing we can do. We can fuck something up. We can make a small mistake that'll like cause all kinds of problems. Uh, I, I sure hope that who's ever monitoring the sun right now is actually paying attention because that is kind of scary. Right? You look across. You look across your screen one day, and then all of a sudden you're like, "Oh wait, hey, what?" I gotta the-? take a shit. Like, hey Tim, watch this YouTube video. <laughs> oh man, <laughs> right? Yeah, I mean, uh, you say, I mean, yes, you say it that way, that that could be could be kind of scary. Yeah, think about it. Okay, all right. I st- oh, go ahead. still don't think it'd be uh, world-ending, but it would still be pretty disastrous. Right, that big rock's not going to do anything to dinosaurs. Just a big, just one big rock. What, you think it was just one rock? You think it was two rocks? I think it was probably just one rock, bro. That's all it took. That... Well, that must have been a gigantic rock. I bet that was a huge rock. That's just surprising that how little we kind of know about that, right? Like, wait a minute, what happened? <laughs> that's going to happen. I mean, and you, but you never think like, oh, you never think that's going to happen to the human race. You're like, oh. I mean, that's what's going to happen at some point. There's going to be some kind of, you know, world-ending something event. I don't know if it'll be an asteroid again. Well, eventually everybody dies. All right, let's move on. Hold on. Do you think you'll ever see that? event in our lifetime where something resets the human race no well i've said this before so i'll make this really quick i do live in seattle which is supposed to be the next time there's a big earthquake here is supposed to be the largest natural disaster of all time 
So, and that's basically forecast to happen kind of any day now within the next 50 years. It's like a real concern here. It's a real problem. I could see something that resets it like for my life, like you're going back to zero. But my thing is the, th the problem that gets you is never the one that you see, see coming. The thing that you are worried about is never as bad as it seems. And the thing that you don't think is a big deal is always much worse than it is. All right. Let's move on to some shout outs now, shall we? Yeah. yeah. All right. Let's see. We're going to start with an easy one here. Greg Bookwood. Hmm. Daryl Ronquillo. Daryl or Darrow? Daryl. Oh, Daryl. Andrew Kim. Hmm. Derek Reed. Doug Bruce, two first names uh, for a whole entire name. Both Cam names. Sutton. Both names that are similar. I put Doug and Bruce on the same tier level of names, and the same type of guy could be named either Doug or Bruce. Okay. Uh, Cam Sutton, Nima Nasiri, Michael Wilford, Trey Saneers, and Derek Thieler. Congratulations. Been a lot of Derek's on the a lot of Derek's on the shout outs lately. I think there's been too many Derek's for how many Derek's exist in society. Well, we appreciate every Derek, every person. And you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna go off kilter for one second and say, you know what? Congratulations to you. Nick Vincent. Congratulations to you. Do you want to tell the people? Yeah, I mean, listen, we are, uh, I don't know how it happened. I have absolutely no idea. We actually won two different awards. We weren't last. Oh. And we got, we got like an Editor's Choice Award or something. Uh, a Signal Award, which is a pretty prestigious podcasting award. Um, so, yeah. I mean, it's almost like winning an Emmy. Like, we just won an Emmy for podcasting. Yeah. To give the official title, I believe we were the Signal Award winner for Best Interview Podcast. Absolutely something that I have no part of, but you're kind of interviewing me now, so I'll count that it's because of me. I would consider that to be an extenuation of the show, right? Yeah. You know what? If I you mean, play in the first, doesn't matter. If you play in the game at all, you're still winning, right? You may not play in the first half. You may not play in the second I half. Mean, but if you see the field, it counts as a win for you. So congratulations. I mean, those... Those judges, I hope, listened to the worst episode imaginable, but loved it still. So good for them. Good on them. Hmm. Do you think it's what, because what? we're good or because everybody else was that terrible, though? Oh, man. I mean, I want to say it's because we're we're that, you know, everyone else was terrible. But to our credit, we were I mean, we were in a stacked category with like high profile names and podcasts. And we were still picked out and in, in, in given an award. So maybe we are good. Maybe maybe we're better than we think. I don't know. If I was John Stewart or the lady from Seinfeld, Julie Louis Dreyfus, I always forget her name until just now. I would fire my staff. Be like <laughs> these people, these two. Imagine like you're Kevin Hart, who is also somebody we beat out, or John Stewart, who is also somebody we beat out. Imagine that they're like, I wonder what this is. Who puts this together? And they look it up, and it's me and you. Like, how pissed off would you be if you're like, what the fuck? I lost to this? It would be like a professional mm. basketball team losing to, like, the a, a high school team that has five, peoples, <laughs> five people in a city with 100 people. I mean, it, it really, I mean, this really is a one-and-a-half-person operation. I'm not going to even count myself as a full person. Um, and, yeah, some of those podcasts have 20, 20 people. 30, yeah, so... Yeah, I don't know. If I was John Stewart, Kevin Hart that next morning, my first question would be, well, why, how did they win? And then my th my third question would be, maybe I should offer them jobs. Well, that's not technically a question. It's a statement. Can we offer them jobs? Should I offer them jobs? <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. Let's do some. I got some bangers for you. Bang, 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 bangers. Okay. Uh, let's okay. see. Would you, would you rather have uh, no eyebrows? Or no nose. Well, no, no, no eyebrows. I can just draw the eyebrows on. If you got no nose, there's not like a lot that you can do with that. The nose is a very central feature to people's faces. Have you ever seen somebody with drawn on eyebrows? It doesn't look normal. Yeah, but I mean, it doesn't look less normal than not having a nose. Okay. I just feel like you're yeah, underestimating yeah. what the eyebrows do for your your expressions. I think that you're underestimating what your nose does. 
I mean, I, I have a pretty big nose. I just realized that looking at it in the camera. I still go back to the thing about if I have big ears or not. I can never decide. Like, yeah, um, but I've no. been told I have gigantic ears. Oh, I thought you actually had little ears. I would say I, I, had little, little. I would describe them as little ears. I would air well, towards that Well, I also have side. a gigantic head. So. Oh, that, yeah, that's true. That's true. It throws it off. You know what they say about gigantic heads? It takes a big hat. Cover that up. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. You just need a big hat. Uh, all right. So that, that one didn't go as expected. Let's try this one. Okay. Uh, would you, what would you be more fearful of? Running out of gas in the desert at night or being stuck on the top floor of a building with no way down? Hmm. Well, running out of the gas in the middle of the desert, you could probably die. That can get you in a lot of trouble. I used to live in Arizona. I made the mistake one time of hiking in 110 degree heat. And by hiking, I mean basically just kind of like walking around in a small park that wasn't like really out in the wilderness. And I probably about 30 minutes into it was like, oh, this isn't normal. I wouldn't mess with the desert, man. Don't mess with water, either too much of it or not enough of it. I mean, you know, I don't want to put Michigan back on the map here, but... Uh, Trust me, you're not going to. According to all the, you know, uh, all the research, apparently Michigan is going to become the uh, migration capital of the world when the earth starts officially heating up to the point of no return because we are just surrounded by bodies of water. Well, that's what it's going to take to get anybody to live in Michigan. <laughs> the end of the world is the only thing that will get people to come back to Detroit. All right, that's just <laughs> literally people are going to have to be like, "Do you want to?" Well, the only way I'm moving to Detroit is if it's the end of the world. It's the end of the world. Like, okay. As as you're talking about a city that may be wrecked forever because of a you know an earthquake. Yeah, but people still want to live in Seattle. It's like it's got mountains that's, in the ocean, man. It's not got incredible. like. Like, uh, what do you got a field there? I think in Detroit, you have like a empty parking lot that people can have fun in. We have a football team that is doing very well. Thank you very much. Okay. Didn't we um, have a bet? Didn't we have a bet? There's maybe. like a dollar. We have to go it's back. A dollar. Like, it's big money. Uh, let's see here. Last one Halloween. How much is too much to spend on a costume? Oh, but you're $50? asking. $50. Or a hundred dollars. You're asking me, dude. Okay, I'm one of the cheapest people I think that most people ever met. I would say that ten dollars. You should be able to make a costume with what you have in your house. I have never really understood people who invested a lot of time and energy in costumes. That to you me has always kid, been you like can't, you can't even buy kid costumes for under fifty dollars. I mean, we got one. It was like ten bucks. It was a Link costume. Of eBay or Amazon or one of those things. I've just never inv I've never really gotten into like the whole. That's just too much work for Halloween. Has it arrived yet? This Link costume? Yeah, actually, I think he got it for Christmas because he wanted that, and then we just repurposed it. My other son's gonna be a tiger, and we're just gonna paint his face. What was what was your what was your favorite cost Halloween costume you ever had? My favorite, yeah. um, probably being the Pillsbury Doughboy. How old were you? seven or eight i don't even remember that's traumatizing i feel like that shouldn't yeah. have, like somebody shouldn't have allowed that i actually kind of uh vetoed halloween i don't remember going out after that until i became like a teenager yeah dude i can see why well yeah, yeah right. that was kind of terrifying sucks to you be you <laughs> i don't know if that lifts you up or not. <laughs> no of course it is doesn't. that not an uplifting statement sucks to be you <laughs> oh the simulation we're living in of course um, but what if it's just like, whose simulation do you think we would be in? My simulation or your simulation right now? Maybe yours? I don't know. That's a great question. Yeah, probably mine. Maybe we're both in, in a simulation and they're just combined together. What if we're in pods right next to each other right now? Like we're in the matrix and we're just sitting next to each other. Oh my God. Right? Like, what if we never left Florida? What if we're not even in Florida? What if we're in space? We're just floating around in space because the Earth's destroyed and they got to... Man, that's so crazy. 
Yeah, like what if my back pain is really just like that thing being plugged into my back somewhere? Uh, okay. Are you ready for our top five? I am, and um, this I don't know. People were very disappointed in us, uh, from what I understood about our lack of being able to come up with this top five list uh last week when we were kind of putting each other on the spot so intro it and then we'll get to it uh so our top five is top five celebrities named after animals or top five celebrities with animal names however you want to put that together either way what's your number five my number five is going to be uh larry bird and sue bird hmm okay i think that's pretty low for larry bird i think that he needs to be a little bit higher up on that list I'm not sure if Sue Bird, Sue Bird may be a legend in her sport, but I don't think that she has the overall kind of notoriety for making it up that high. That's my personal opinion. I, I agree with you, uh, but at, you know, at the same point, they're both basketball players. They're both Hall of Famers, or I don't know if she is. I think Will she's going be, to be. I think so, yeah. But yeah, so I'm all right with that. Larry and Sue Bird, bring it on down. Tony Hawk. My number five is Tony Hawk. See, I, I think that's too... Uh, high on the list for for Tony Hawk. I think I think he deserves a higher spot. I think that you didn't fully think out the animal names thing, and there's going to be that you're some that you're going to be like, oh, I forgot about that one. I didn't think of that one. Okay, what's your number four? Uh, Seal. <laughs> does Does anyone know his real name? Uh, no, I think that's part of it. Um. I wonder what his real What is his name? real name? That's one of the few people that you only know their first name. Seal, Prince, Madonna. I don't think Madonna is her real name. That's obviously oh. not her real name. What is Madonna's real name? You look up Seal's real name, I'll look up Madonna's real name. Well, I picked the hard one because Seal has six names. Oh, God. Seal Henry, Alos Alo Gun. Olumide Adola Samuel is oh. Seal's full name. Madonna has four names. Madonna Luis Veronica Siccone. C-I-C-C-O-N-E. Siccone. She's Italian. Oh, all right. Bay City, Michigan. Where's that? Yeah. Do you even know? Yeah, it's about an hour and a half north of the Metro Detroit area oh okay okay uh my number four is a tie between michael j fox and jamie fox i think that michael j fox would have been the more famous of the two had his illness not happened but now i think you got to put michael j fox and jamie fox on the same level uh you know i i thought about putting uh at least michael j fox jamie fox or you can make an argument too won't for but i they just barely missed the cut for me for a top five. I'm going to have to see what's on yours because that's a pretty, I mean, my number three is Larry Bird. My number three is Snoop Dogg. Oh, but not his real name, though. No, but I mean, I think it's fair enough. I mean, no one knows him. If you can't tell me his real name, then he goes by his stage name. Calvin Brodus. I didn't look that up, but I think that his real name is Calvin Brodus. Yeah, I know he's, I mean, listen, I know he's one of the more famous ones that we know, but I'm sticking with it. Snoop Dogg as my number three. It is Calvin Brodus. Calvin Cordazer Brodus Jr. It's all these long, elongated names. That's the secret, man. Everybody, you got to, if you want to be a big. I don't know. I agree with you on Snoop Dogg. I don't feel like that should quite count. That's my personal opinion. That was my number. I gave my number three is Larry Bird. What's your number two? So my number two, this, this is where I got to. Because my number one is is unanimous. I think you have the same number one as I do, or you should. Uh, but my number two, I have I have Tony Hawk as my number two. Okay. I have Robin Williams. Okay. All right. I... See, I, 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 once again, I, I, it's tough for me in that number five spot. I was like, so many choices. I don't yeah, know, Robin how, Williams. I don't know how you leave Robin one. Williams off the list, honestly. Yeah, I mean, maybe, maybe. Who's your number one? Uh, my number one is Tiger Woods. Yeah, Tiger Woods. I think Tiger Woods is the most famous person named after an animal. What I love is that we both had completely different two through fives. But it's like, yeah, number one is unanimous. Tiger Woods was a 
probably one of the probably the most famous person in the world at one time and he changed the game that he played in and even after how many years since he's been really really good he's still a big draw like i'll watch a golf tournament because tiger woods is playing with no caring of <laughs> anything else like oh tiger's playing yeah. Yeah, I mean, for for what he was able to do and the crowd he was able to draw, like, yeah, it's that's not even part of it. Just he has it's a cool name. His name's first name is Tiger. I mean, that's awesome. Which is crazy because his first name is like his name is Tiger, but his other name is Eldridge. It's just like the exact opposite, right? Like, give him a cool name and then a really <laughs> dorky name. <laughs> What's in your honorable mention? I have so many good ones in my honorable honorable mention. Uh, you mentioned a few, so since you have a bunch, you said uh, two that I'll throw out there: Raven Simone. Oh, that's a good one. I didn't think of that. And Bear Grylls. I don't know who that is. I have heard that name, but I have never actually seen that person or anything that he's ever done. I mean, he's really famous uh, as being an outdoorsman and survivalist and all that. But you know, if you don't watch a lot of cable TV, you probably wouldn't have access to him, I would imagine. I really thought his name was Bear Grylls. I it was I'm Bear sure. Grylls. Maybe it's Grylls. I'm pretty sure it's Grylls, though. Okay. Uh, I'm going to start. I'm going to go. You just tell me. Uh, no, I'm just going to start saying him. Lance Bass? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. Continue on the fish theme, Mike Trout? Yep. Switching it up a little bit, John Cougar Mellencamp. Okay. All right. I like that. Yep. One you may not have think of, but then once you realize, you're like, oh yeah, Jay Leno. Mm, okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. I guess. Jay yeah, Leno's a good one, right? You don't necessarily associate the two, but yeah. Okay. Uh, Wolf Blitzer. <laughs> oh, that's a good one. That is a good one. That's is a that good his one too. Real name? That you think? Can't Wolf be Blitzer. His real name. That takes balls, especially of all the guys. Like, that's not a guy. What's the real? Wolf Isaac Blitzer. That's his real name. Wow. That takes some balls, especially he was born in 1948. So somebody in the 1950s was like, that kid's name is Wolf. Which means, it's, yeah. I mean, I had a couple more. Um, oh, go for it, throw. baby. Go for it, baby. Megan Fox. Yeah. Not the same tier as any other foxes, but yes. Cheryl Crow. Oh yeah, that's she. She could make a run for it. She could make a run for it. And my personal favorite, Newt Gingrich. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, this one's older. Florence Nightingale. Florence Nightingale. Okay. Yeah. Yep. I think he was a singer. He may was either the singer or he was an actor, but Adam Ant. Yeah, Adam Ant. He was an he was an uh, um, a singer. 